Okay, yeah. Okay, well, uh, just so that we keep on time, I'll just go ahead. Um, yes, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, this is my first time in Corfu. It's certainly a very beautiful place, uh, and it's nice to meet uh, so many new folks. Um, I'm going to talk today about the geometric uh, new standard model effective field theory, uh, which is based on some work that I put out uh, last week, and uh, part, of the, part of the talk will be based on some work with Mike Trott, uh, last year. Um, it builds on what is now a growing bit of literature in this approach to understanding bottom-up effective field theories in geometric ways. And whenever I say geometry, I mean that in the most naive possible way, and I'll try and intuit that for you. Uh, this is a formalism talk, not a phenomenology talk, uh, but somehow it's not formal nor phenomenological, and I apologize for that. In as much as I'm happy to be here and to, uh, to meet all of you, um, I'd say a, a driving reason I wanted to be here is I wanted to see where Graham Ross uh, loved to spend his summers and do his physics over the summer. Um, Graham was a DPhil advisor uh, of mine, uh, and uh, it was a great honor to get to know him professionally and personally. He was an amazing physicist, but also uh, a, a brilliant mentor, and I owe quite a lot to him, as I'm sure many people do. Um, I'm going to talk about something, of course, that's been brought up for the last uh, two talks, uh, uh, one more phenomenological and one adding an additional particle to the IR spectrum. Uh, this is a Smith talk, of course. Uh, this is built around this Lagrangian, which is uh, 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 the renormalizable interactions of the standard model um, uh, supplemented with a tower of non-renormalizable interactions, uh, which generically parameterize uh, the infrared effects of potential ultraviolet physics. Um, the assumptions in this Lagrangian are, of course, that the field and symmetry content of the standard model are the same, and that the scales associated to the new physics, uh, i.e. lambda, are larger than that characteristic of the standard model. So this expansion is at play here. Uh, all of you folks will know here that uh, the operators can be enumerated order by order. Uh, at lowest order in the non-normalizable tower, we, of course, have the Weinberg operator, which gives us uh, light left-handed Mayoran and neutrino masses as such upon electroweak symmetry breaking. But for over a decade, we've also had a complete and non-redundant basis of dimension six operators, right? Uh, Dipole-like operators, derivative operators, Yukawa-like operators, and a whole host of four fermion operators. Uh, the reason I've plastered this mass nasty table, of course, uh, on the screen is because already at dimension six, things are not so easy, especially if you want to think in terms of doing global fits to these parameters these coefficients, so that we can get really concrete insight into the kinds of new physics that might be at play. Um, this doesn't get any better going to higher orders in the operator product expansion. And for the last seven or eight years, we've had a great hold on the numbers of operators that are popping up um, at higher orders, thanks to the advent of Hilbert series techniques uh, and their application to the effective field theory. So this is a plot from Henning et al. from back in 2015. The lower lines are uh, the number of operators on the y-axis versus mass dimension on the x for one flavor. Uh, and then the upper lines are for three flavors. You see already at dimension six, moving from one flavor to three introduces uh, about a factor of 3,000 new operators, much less going up here. The problem, of course, um, uh, has already been highlighted much, much clearer for me uh, by Celine, right, uh, and Matthias, uh, and the others yesterday, Diane in particular. These higher order corrections are a priori present whenever we want to go about working with the standard model effective field theory, uh, and they can be important. Um, but the more and more we add on, of course, the more mathematically unwieldy this theory gets to be, uh, and the more difficult it becomes to do global fits that are consistent especially once you include all of the operator mixing, RG evolution, et cetera. This, of course, can obscure the physics conclusions that are drawn from the EFT, and this really can bring doubt upon the entire EFT program in general. So it's worth having a look at what's generating this large rise in operators, of course, just beyond what's beginning pumped out of uh, the Molly and Vial formula. And uh, this cartoon schematic here at least pumps out uh, a, a couple insight there, right? In this expansion and one over lambda to various powers, right? There are various kinds of operators coming from innate expansion that you can understand as forming the basis of the standard model effective field theory, right? There are kinematic expansions in invariant mass p squared, 
excuse me, uh, momentum p squared. Uh, these come largely from derivative insertions. And then there's, of course, this uh, innate expansion in the Higgs VEV over the scale of new physics. And this is coming from operators with successive Higgs insertions, so-called scalar dressings, right? And then, of course, uh, not contributing to the true-level Lagrangian, but obviously relevant whenever we actually have to go calculate something is perturbation theory, which is uh, embedded as well, of course. So what I'm gonna talk about later, um, or in the next couple of slides, is some geometric insight that, at least for the first time to my knowledge, starts to at least put this expansion of the SMEFT under a little bit better control. And it really comes from a refactorization of the SMEFT Lagrangian. So the outline of the talk is as follows. I'll briefly reintroduce the GeoSMEFT. Um, I'll then introduce, so the way I got into the GeoSMEFT, of course, was to try and think about, you know, uh, one, to understand it, and then two, I thought the best way to do that would be to <laughs> add on a new particle and build another one, the GeoNuSMEFT. So I'll show you what happens there. Nothing surprising comes up, but of course it does open up new routes to phenomenology with light zero neutrinos. Um, and then I'll briefly discuss uh, what we might be able to do in the flavor sector in this all orders formalism. So how do I intuit uh, the GeoSMEFT? I apologize for those in the room who have already heard uh, these couple of slides. Well, I'll show you uh, what I came to understand this as, right? Uh, this is the SMEFT Lagrangian I already showed you. Uh, and the idea, of course, is to simply refactorize this Lagrangian in terms of a tower of so-called field space connections, GI, and composite operator forms, FI. Now, GI are innately dependent on the real scalar field coordinates of the Higgs uh, and internal symmetry generator indices, and they're built, as I mentioned a couple slides back, from successive insertions of Higgs fields, potentially Higgs fields with symmetry generators. The composite operator forms, on the other hand, are the things that carry all of the non-trivial Lorentz indices of the theory, um, all of the momentum dependence, uh, and form the, uh, uh, that structure of the Lagrangian. Now, why would you want to do this kind of refactorization, right? Well, it's because this Lagrangian has a scalar in it. Um, it's the Higgs doublet, shown here in terms of four real coordinates. We know that that Higgs acquires a VEV, and we know what happens whenever the Higgs acquires a VEV. At the renormalizable level, of course, it gives us fermion masses from these sorts of diagrams. It also gives us boson masses from these sorts of diagrams. What's been noticed for at least uh, six or so years um, is that at non-renormalizable, at the non-renormalizable level, successive insertions of the Higgs give geometries, okay? This was first noted by Alonzo, Jenkins, and Manahar in the context of uh, scalar connections in the Higgs effective field theory. Uh, and just a couple of years ago, uh, Mike Trott, Andreas Helset, and Adam Martin uh, formalized this for the standard model effective field theory with full electroweak symmetry. So how do I understand this last comment, that at higher orders in the OPE, geometries start to appear in this Lagrangian? Well, first, let's just start with one sector of this. Let's call, let's look at the gauge field strength terms. That would be one of these Fi. And let's expand those at dimension six, right? You have mixing SU2 bosons. You have uh, an U1 hypercharge boson. You have these kinds of operators with Higgs insertions and so on and so forth, and then one mixing term between the SU2 and U1 bosons, right? Well, if you write up the electroweak gauge bosons in terms of a four-dimensional vector curly tilde, uh, <laughs> curly W, with an index that runs from one to four, you can reorganize this structure as follows, right? You get these two gauge field strengths rewritten in this basis, which compose an Fi, and then you get this object GAB in terms of uh, these indices. And of course, if you actually look at the structure of GAB, you see that it starts to look exactly like a metric in the field space defined by this composite operator. You have ones on the diagonal, and then you have contributions from these operators showing up uh, both on the diagonal and off diagonally. So the observation of Manohar, Trot, and all these folks is that this connection, this field space connection G, GAB is just an instance of GI, amounts to a metric in the field space defined here. And then of course, new physics simply amounts to some sort of deformation or curvature on that field space, okay? The standard model would correspond to some sort of flat direction. That's pretty much the extent of the geometry I'm gonna tell you about the geometric uh, SMEF, by the way. That was at D equals six, however, okay? We can then go to higher dimensions, right, in this OPE. So let's look at this metric again, calling it a metric now and consider the higher order operators that can connect these two gauge field strengths. Well, 
Dimension 6 had these three contributions that's listed here. But then if you go to dimension eight, you see this kind of structure. You see Higgs insertions, right? Uh, by the way, this is dimension six plus arbitrary dimensions, right? There's an N index here. But this is also dimension eight plus arbitrary, dimension, uh, arbitrary dimensions in. Um, and you see that you get this additional symmetry structure in the uh, Higgs insertions just due to these poly matrices that are floating in here. But if you were to go to higher and higher orders, you would see that actually no other composite operators are showing up. Everything just gets refect, shuffled into the field space connection. These operators in my language would say, I'd say they saturate. And you can see this just by calculating the Hilbert series associated to them and imposing this factorization. But this holds at all orders. So you can then write down this field space connection at all orders, right? And that's all that's been happened here, right? It looks quite complicated, but in all actuality, this is just a mapping of these objects into a four dimensional real uh, 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 space. Um, I've just taken the SU2, the electroweak generators actually, written them into a four dimensional real representation, that's gamma, um, and then worked out what these contractions uh, in internal space look like. And that's this here. You see these dimension six plus terms are coming simply from these objects. This phi squared is coming from this SU2 contraction. And then you have this dimension eight contributions coming from here, okay, and so on and so forth. So at least for the first time for me, maybe not for you folks, this was, this was something that looked cool. This is, this is an object that you can define at all orders uh, in this effective field theory. I thought that was neat and worth exploring. And it's obvious also that in the Higgs phase, this of course just reduces to some number uh, plus emissions uh, of the physical Higgs. That was just the gauge field uh, strength tensors, two points. Uh, you can show actually that at two and three points, a finite list of so-called field space connections can be found in this SMEFT. And that's what composed the so-called GeoSMEFT of a couple years ago. Um, they include the one that I just showed you, uh, this field strength tensor sector, but also a scalar connection, which was the ones explored by Manahar and company, um, Jenkins and Alonzo earlier. You also have dipole-like terms, you cover like terms, so on and so forth. They all exhibit this saturation type structure I showed you here. If you look at the composite operators that are weighting them, and you see that most of them saturate quite quickly in mass dimension, normally at the first uh, or second uh, counting where they're relevant. Uh, this also, of course, can be interpreted as a reduction in the number of effective field theory parameters floating around, right? Because if this is all combined into one object, I can redefine the things that contribute to it uh, at that order. Now that's a tree level statement. And I'll mention later that we're still looking to try and understand what that means at higher uh, loop orders. Another nice thing about these connections is that they're often field redefinition invariant, which is nice when you want to go and calculate uh, amplitudes. And critically, at least from the phenomenological perspective, the Lagrangian parameters that you define in these field space connections, gauge couplings, fermion masses, gauge boson masses, are themselves defined at all orders. Sorry, it just had a little snag there. So that means for the mass of the up quark, you can have an all orders expression in the standard model effective field theory as you can for, as I said, gauge couplings and so on and so forth. Because these field space connections are defined at all orders, you can also, and because they have no momentum independence, it all comes from the composite operators, you can also rapidly derive Feynman rules that hold at all V over lambda orders, and that's before you calculate some physical amplitude. So, for example, the decay width of the Z boson to two fermions uh, in the GeoSMEFT at tree level, that's this diagram with arbitrary scalar insertions, is just given by this expression here, where all of the contributing factors, the Z boson mass, the mass of the fermions, and this effective coupling expanded here, are all defined at all orders in V over lambda. So, this uh, uh, can be argued uh, to be, uh, as I said, all orders at tree level, and then you want to look a little bit harder uh, at what that means at loop orders. But you can also trivially expand this uh, to, say, dimension eight, which gives very clear insight into what an amplitude would look like, including full dimension eight corrections, which, as Celine mentioned earlier, is extremely important a priori. It also shows the implicit dependence of all of the parameters of the theory on higher order corrections that are being absorbed by this tower of operators. 
So a lot of work has been done on that. I've not done any of that. Um, that was prior to me getting deeply involved in this. Uh, one of them includes a nice fit to electroweak precision data from Tyler Corbett, Mike Trott, and Andreas Helsett, uh, where they really expose how useful it is to use this kind of formalism, uh, uh, then expand, no mistakes included, all cancellations present uh, to do a dimension eight fit. You can also start to calculate a loop the Higgs tadpole has been calculated where each vertex uh, holds at all new over lambda orders. That was by Tyler Corbett. So, <clears throat> as I said, one of the things that I got interested in was these all order structures, and I thought maybe I can learn a bit more about this by including a little bit beyond the standard model field content, right? And the extent to which you're interested in the geometric NUSMEFT is the extent to which you're interested in the possibility of there being light gauge singlets otherwise known as standard, excuse me, sterile neutrinos uh, floating around your infrared Lagrangian, right? So, uh, of course, the idea is to add some uh, right-handed neutrino in, uh, which is a gauge singlet, as I say. And the motivations, uh, as you can find in a large literature that I'm just beginning to explore, are, of course, multifold. Um, you, of course, introduce renormalizable mass terms for the neutrinos a priori. Uh, you have a potential dark matter candidate, and I would point you to Pasquale's talk later in the week. Um, you also have a number of long-standing anomalies in neutrino oscillation data that might be resolved by including uh, sterile neutrino, perhaps at the EV scale. If you include this object here, um, you get uh, a Lagrangian that looks like this. Of course, at renormalizable level, all you get is a propagating sterile neutrino um, and uh, two Majorana mass terms, lepton number violating, and then two Yukawa terms um, I've just written out the Hermitian conjugates here, uh, where this N couples in with the SU2L. But of course, if this is your infrared particle content, then you might want to think in the same lines that we do uh, with the SMEFT and expand this to a non-renormalizable Lagrangian given here in terms of the standard model, uh, these few terms, and then an entire tower of non-renormalizable operators that are independent and which, of course, include all of the SMEFT terms as well. Um, this is a field of study that's uh, quite active, um, but uh, much like the dimension 8 SMEFT that Celine uh, noted uh, at, at uh, uh, for, excuse me, just without this content, without the star neutrino, a dimension 9 basis actually has uh, been around for only about a year or so from the same authors, I believe, Lee et al. Um, this is a table I took, though, where I show you that you can use some nice tools for calculating with Hilbert series on the market. My favorite is this new one from Rudy Rahn and Walter Weilemann. Uh, and at arbitrary flavors, you can calculate the number of operators uh, contributing um, uh, at really at arbitrary orders. I think calculating at dimension 11 took me like 1.5 seconds for three flavors on my laptop. The top rows are just uh, all operators included here, and the bottom ones are only the ones that include sterile neutrinos. So you get two. Uh, as is uh, known at dimension five, right? You get uh, Higgs, Higgs dagger augmenting the lepton number violating mass, and then you get uh, uh, a B mu nu field strength with two sterile neutrinos. So we want to make this into a geometric object so that we can understand some of its all orders behavior, and we're going to do that again at two and three points, which means we're going to include operators that involve uh, Higgs derivative. Um, a derivative on a fermion field, and then a field strength tensor. And again, this is written up in this notation, but all of these objects are quite familiar. This is, includes all of the electroweak bosons, and these are electroweak generators written in that four-dimensional representation. So imposing this factorization again, but on the new SMEFT, uh, we then want to ask what kind of operators can contribute to this. Well, of course, said we only want two to three-point interactions. We obviously only want to enumerate things that have dependence on the novel sterile neutrino. And that means, of course, that we're going to need to, two fermions. So this is then really quick to find that the list of field space connections and composite operator forms for the geometric NUSMEFT are as follows. You get the enhanced Yukawa operator, the enhanced Majorana mass operator for the sterile guy. You also get dipole-like operators with various fermion structures here and you get single derivative operators of this kind of structure, again, with various fermion bilinears. So 
what do we have to do? Well, we have to prove, of course, that these objects saturate just like they do in the new SMIFT, excuse me, in the SMIFT. There's absolutely no reason to think that they wouldn't, right? All of the innate symmetry that the Hilbert series is, is exploiting and all of the equations of motions and redundancy kinds of procedures that it exploits uh, are the same. So you just have to work it out. And uh, that's one of the things I did. And you show that for all of these new SMIFT field space connections, you see saturation uh, quickly um, in mass dimension. And I've just left the mass dimension at which they appear uh, implicit because you have both odd operators. You have things showing up at dimension five, like I mentioned. Uh, and then dimension seven, but you also have things showing up at dimension six uh, as well. So you see that most of them, like the Yukawa-like objects, saturate immediately, just as they did in the standard model effective field theory. By the way, NF is the number of flavors I've allowed for stereo neutrinos, NL is the number of standard model flavors. I just kept that generic. Uh, we can add one, two, three, or arbitrarily many stereo neutrinos to this Lagrangian. But for other things like this dipole type operator, DNL, you have, again, this kind of jump. And it happens precisely the same way that the jump happened for the electroweak, uh, excuse me, yeah, for the, um, for the gauge field strengths in the SMEFT. You have some operator that contributes at dimension six uh, as such, right? And then at dimension eight, you have one more jump, but you only have contributions coming from the SU2 bosons, and that's this one minus delta factor showing up here. So at dimension six, you'd have 36. And then at dimension eight, you have this additional 18 operators. And that explains this factor of three halves here. By the way, this is for three flavors all involved. And you can write down the field space connection um, by doing a little bit of algebra and uh, just some, some, some symmetry manipulations. Uh, and it's given here. It's nice and compact. Uh, I'll just flash these in front of you. Uh, these are all of the connections that were derived in this paper. You have the two mass type connections, which of course include those two terms I mentioned prior from the Yukawa and lepton number violating sector. There were normalizable new SMEFs plus the tower of new things showing up. You have these dipole type connections plus the one I just showed you. And then you have these derivative type connections um, that are showing up as well. <clears throat> I think I... I'm going okay, so let me tell you what I want to know now, more about this formalism, uh, not just the new SMEF, but, excuse me, the geometric new SMEF, but also the geometric SMEF, or any other effective field theory you might want to embed in this sort of geometric formalism. Most notably, I want to know what these connections look like under a normalization group evolution, and I have to thank Matthias Neubert and Uli Heisch for really honing in on that at a workshop earlier in the year. Um, I've done a little bit of homework, and um, uh, there's some hope. And in fact, my collaborators who've been thinking about this longer tell me there's great hope that this all orders behavior may actually be preserved. Um, we're going to have to use some techniques so that are probably showing up in exceptional scalar fields. Also, I showed you that the, uh, the, the gauge field strengths right in the SMEFT were a metric, right? Uh, that's also true for the scalar connections, DME phi, DME phi. But I haven't said anything about what kinds of objects are these things are describing, right? These don't look immediately like metrics to me. Um, and I want to know what they are and if they're anything interesting, what we can learn from that uh, whenever we start to apply more geometric techniques to thinking about this. Also, I think it would be neat to look at what unitarity constraints mean in a theory where some objects are defined at all orders. And of course, I want to use these things to do high order calculations and fits in the same way that we can do with the geo Smith based on all those literature reference I pointed out earlier. So to that end, that latter end, um, I'm just gonna show you uh, what I told you earlier, which is that one of the things you can do once you have these field space connections defined is you can derive all orders fine minerals right from the outset. And in this paper, I did the easiest ones. Uh, I did the ones where the connections um, uh, uh, have no, uh, no special form, right? Um, excuse me, where the composite operators have no momentum dependence, sorry. Uh, regardless of that latter comment, of course, these Feynman rules are just going to be proportional to the variation of the connections with respect to the physical Higgs, all VEVed. But whenever there's no momentum dependence floating around, as in the mass type operators there, um, you can rapidly derive the field, excuse me, the Feynman rules uh, for these types of interactions, i.e. between stereo neutrinos, 
cell neutrinos and SU2 leptons uh, and the Higgs. And they come out in compact forms and they all have these sums from n equals zero to infinity, thank you. Um, the second line here is just a reorganization in terms of the overall mass uh, implied by the lepton number violating connection M. You can just reorganize that and rewrite uh, the Yukawa there. So with this, of course, you can go ahead and calculate an all new over lambda orders tree level Higgs decay, for example. Um, you can also calculate contributions to say self normalization of the sterile neutrinos, but more independent processes can and should be pursued in this formalism as they have been uh, in the regular NUSMEF, but at a fixed order. Uh, another, of course, interesting thing is to look at the structure of neutrino masses and mixings. Uh, this is entirely generalized. This formula many of you will recognize, of course, but now I've got these field space connections sitting in my mass matrix here. I've reorganized the neutrinos into vectors uh, with both active and sterile states included. And of course, uh, I've defined a Weinberg connection associated to the dimension five Weinberg operator and its all orders generalization. That hadn't been done before, so I thought it was cute to do that. It's super easy, it's straightforward. Um, if you diagonalize this, of course, you're introducing any number of important parameters, including sterile mixing matrix, sterile mixing elements. Um, and of course, in the spirit of having all orders gauge couplings, all orders fermion masses, all orders CKM parameters, you want to know what those can look like at all new over teal orders. Um, I think that if I've got one minute left, I won't be able to tell you about the way I think we should do this. It's using flavor invariance in the same way Mike Trott and I did a year ago to find expressions for Yukawa eigenvalues or mass eigenvalues in the Dirac Yukawa sector um, or CKM mixing angles or CP violating phase, the Dirac phase of the CKM at all orders. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, that was using invariant theory that's been known for quite some time. Um, if you want to do that for neutrinos, um, the, it gets messy and it gets messy quickly. In fact, the number of invariants, the minimal basis of invariants for the three flavor dynamical seesaw model, not even including uh, the Weinberg connection, the Hilbert series is known, but the minimal number of invariants that you can extract from it is not, okay? So I'll leave you there and let you read my summary and outlook and thank you again, but also thanks to Graham for inspiring me uh, in general and to be here, of course, with you. Thanks. Okay, so first of all, I have a comment, actually, I don't know whether I question. So uh, this geometric point of view has been uh, started in 1984 by Wilkowski and DeWitt okay. uh, with a chart and uh, to uh, get a unique action for quantum gravity. Yep. Uh, then he moved to gauge theories and uh, to inflation, which I also happen to work on uh, similar okay. geometric techniques. And uh, the problem, I don't understand your construction there. Uh, especially for fermions. For the fermions, for the case of fermions, it's very hard. And uh, usually the uh, affine connection and the geometry is taken from the kinetic terms. Mm -hmm. As far as I could see from you, in your case, you are uh, using the mass terms of the fermions as a bilinear to obtain the, uh, the geometry of the space. Uh, this is... Uh, creates a number of problems. Okay, I don't like to go through that, but can you comment on that? Maybe I have a, a wrong uh, impression here. Uh, well, it's certainly true that I'm claiming that this structure has some implicit thing, and I want to know what it is. I've called it a geometry, and that's associated to the mass there and there. But I've also defined these for other things that don't look like standard model mass terms, things that look like dipole operators in the EFT. Uh, no, no, no. I just define this directly from what I look. Okay. Well, then I'd be, I'd be keen to learn. But I'm quite honest in that. Perhaps we could speak afterwards. I'd be learned. Matthias Neubert. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to see if I understand 
correctly what the philosophy of this is. Um, defining these metrics and connections is, of course, geometrically very nice, but per se, it's not a reduction of parameters, right? In the sense that all the SMEFT couplings, if you wanted to understand these metrics to all orders in their shape exactly, you would have all the parameters of the SMEFT Lagrangian. So yep. is the idea that at the end of the day, you say, we don't really care about 17 Higgs vertices or something. We want to look at simple interactions with one Higgs or two Higgses. And then basically you get the derivatives of this metric around the VEF background, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so, so basically you define the metric evaluated at the VEF, that would be a parameter. You would call that as one parameter and you would call the derivative, which is the one Higgs interaction, you would call another parameter. And then you say basically in practice, this reduces the couplings to a smaller set of relevant parameters. Is that the idea? In practice, yes, Matthias, but also I'm, I'm a little more hesitant on that statement than maybe some of my colleagues are, because they claim that just by writing this into one form, it reduces all of these things. I think that that's a tree-level statement, and as I said, you've helped me understand that. If I can understand how this thing, sorry, seems to be lagging. If I can understand how this thing RG evolves, and then I can see that there's still order of structure, well, then I have a theory at all orders and all scales, and then I probably can identify a minimal subset of parameters that I would expect to be less than the infinite tower of coefficients there. For now, as long as we're just tree-level tree expanding, I think your, think your comment is, is something mm -hmm. I'd agree with. Okay. And I mean, these jumps in dimension, they're easy to understand, right? You basically count Trivial. a number of uh, gauge indices and... Each time you want to saturate a gauge index, it costs you two units in... Uh, Effect, in, yeah, right? as, yeah it, yes. And it, it all comes down to additional SU2 symmetry yeah. generators. Yeah. And, and the, the algebra of that. The Hilbert series knows about that, but that's what happens. Okay, Celine de Grand, I was asking about on slide 10, you give the number of operators with neutrinos, but you have like a thousand for tree generation. Sorry. Without the neutrino, there's already like 4,000. So I was wondering if you're proposing some flavor symmetry or something like that. I mean, maybe the comment, but. Uh, you mean here? Yeah, dimension six with three flavors of neutrinos, you have something like a thousand? Yeah, maybe this, is, I, maybe this is just a novel independent. I'll have to check that. That could be a type. It, it can be just a new one or yeah, something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just, okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, I'll check that for you. Okay, this thanks. is fresh. <laughs> thank you. Ah, that's why. Jimmy, right? All right, so my talk is actually the continuation of the talk which I gave here online last year, but I have some new development and I will start from the beginning. Uh, I will talk about non renormalizable interactions, not in the sense of uh, effective theory, I will take it seriously. So, you know that we used with the standard model to work with renormalizable interactions, but we all know that gravity is not, and people continue and continue trying to do something with gravity and trying to overcome this difficulty, and we all know what are the problems. We know the problem that the divergences grow up, so you have new and new operators, and then that the amplitudes grow with energy rather than decrease. And so these are the two big problems which we have to face. And uh, I'm not going to solve these problems for you. I'm just going to say that despite all these problems, you can do many things in non-renormalizable non theories. And in fact, field theory is a quite 
a clever thing. It's cleverer than we are. And so you do many things, and the field theory tells you what actually is happening. So what I'm going to say is that in general, when you consider quantum field theory, you consider a renormalization procedure. It is not limited to renormalizable interactions. It's a general procedure which was developed in 50s which tells you how you can subtract divergences in any amplitude, in any green function, going from loop to loop, and how the divergences show up like local structures. And that is actually a very important thing, that all divergences are local structures. And divergences are linked to high energy behavior or high field behavior with theory. And so you can use this property in order to investigate this property even if you don't know precisely how to, how to you subtract these divergences. When I have say subtract, I mean that you have infinities which can be removed by this procedure, but you have arbitrariness. And this arbitrariness in a renormalizable case is reduced to few parameters, and then you know what to do. In the case of non-renormalizable theories, it's an infinite arbitrariness. And that's why we don't know what to do. But there are several characteristics which are independent on this arbitrariness. And in particular, if you want to consider the leading uh, behavior from the point of view of momenta or from the point of view of the field, this leading behavior, leading logs, if you like, they are independent on this arbitrariness. And so you can deal with them. And that's what I want to demonstrate to you. So this is based on several publications with my collaborators. And let me just remind you what happens when you try to consider some arbitrary theory, even non-renormalizable or renormalizable, it doesn't matter, and you want to subtract these divergences and see what happens. So you have some n-loop amplitude or n-loop green function or whatever you want to choose, and then you consider the sub-divergences in one loop, in two loop, in three loop, up to n minus one loop, and you subtract them one by one. So you add to your diagram, sorry. So you add to your diagram, which is here, you subtract one loop counter term, two loop counter term, n minus one loop counter term, and you have the whole series. And the statement is that when you do all this, the final divergence is a local operator. That means that if you expand it, this, this, all these divergences have to be related to one to another, otherwise these non-local terms will not cancel. So you can solve this in the sense of equations and find out that in the, you're talking about leading order divergence or leading order behavior from the point of view of, say, a uh, logarithm of momenta or logarithm of the field. So this leading behavior in n loops is actually related to the one loop coefficient. We know it very well in the renormalization group. You take the one loop beta function, and this counts your all leading terms. So the same happens always. If you have, if you are talking about leading terms, you just need one loop diagram, and then you can calculate everything else pure algebraically. If you want to go further, you want to go to the next leading order, you need two loop diagrams to be calculated. So today I'm talking just about leading order. So my point is that because of this locality of quantum field theory, even in non-renormalizable case, if you want to collect all the leading terms, what you need to know, you need to know <coughs> just one loop. So let me just demonstrate you on a simple example of a renormalizable phi to the first theory, how it works. So consider this diagram, which is a two-loop diagram. It's double divergence. I use here dimensional regularization to regularize this divergence. So it has two divergences because you have a substructure here. So it's one or epsilon square term. This is a leading divergence, and this is a subleading divergence. And then you subtract this, this one loop counter term here, and that is what is called R operation or renormalization operation. And altogether, these two expressions, this one and that one, should be local. So if you expand over epsilon, you have this log of S terms, which are non-local, and they must cancel. And they cancel only in the case if these coefficients are related. And this tells you 
that the leading coefficient of the leading divergence is related to the one loop divergence. So this is the relation. So in this particular case, the higher order term is just the square of it. And this is the beginning of a geometrical progression, as we know. But this is just a simple example of renormalizable interaction. The same is true if you consider the same model, say, not in four dimensions, but in six dimensions, then it will be non-renormalizable, but still this will hold. The relation will be a little bit more tricky. It will not be just the square. It will be some integrated square, but still it's valid. So the higher order terms are always related to the one, uh, to the lower order terms because of this locality. So this is the locality of a field theory, which is essential. In fact, all the renormalization group is a, is a consequence of the locality. Even if you don't have multiplicity of renormalization, in case of non-renormalizable models, Renormalization is not multiplicative, but this relation is still holds, locality is still holds, and the relation between coefficients is still there. So this is how it looks in picture. So you can say, for instance, you consider some amplitude, two by two scattering, and you apply this renormalization procedure, and this is a subtraction. You have to subtract all the terms, and this is a one loop live diagram which gives you all contribution. All the other terms will not be needed. Everything is linked to one loop. That allows you to construct some recurrence relations and you solve this relation. So um, recurrence relations uh, symbolically looks like this. So you have leading divergences n loops times n, and this is related to the leading divergence in n minus one loops times this live diagram. In case of renormalizable interactions, this is a pure multiplication. So you have this. In case of non-renormalizable case, this is not a multiplication. This is an integration procedure. So it's more tricky, but it's still the same. And these recurrence relations can be reduced to a differential equation. And this is a symbolically written differential equation, which is, in case of renormalizable theory, just reduced to the ordinary RG equation, which we all know. But in non-renormalizable case, this equation is still valid, though you have to integrate over, uh, over some one-loop diagram. So the difference is that it's not a multiplication, it's kind of integration inside of it. So if you write it explicitly, this integration is shown here. And you know, this integration goes over Feynman parameters. The point is uh, that in non-renormalizable case, the amplitude depends on momenta. And if you introduce Feynman parameters, so it's not constant, it's a function of momenta. And that's why you have Feynman parameters there. And that's why this equation, this RG equation looks like this. These are two examples of a supersymmetric theories in six dimensions and in eight dimensions. So in six dimensions for the leading two by two scattering amplitude, this is an equation. And this is in, uh, in, for, um, uh, in eight dimensions. And you see, of course, that this is not easily solvable, so you can do it numerically, which we did several times ago. So we, there are several examples for the scattering amplitudes we considered, some supersymmetric cases, non-supersymmetric cases, phi to the fourth theory, West Zumina model, with quartic interaction, it's all works and everywhere. But today my topic is different. Today I'm going to talk about the effective potential. So we consider four-dimensional case, we consider the arbitrary scalar theory, and we'll see what happens with the effective potential if you add quantum correction. So I want to add one loop quantum correction, and then I want to sum the leading quantum correction to all loops in all orders of perturbation theory for the leading behavior. As I'm saying that leading behavior doesn't depend on the arbitrariness of the uh, renormalization procedure. So in a sense, it's by itself. And so I will try to show you how you can write the recurrence relation for the leading order terms, log phi terms, phi of the field, and how you can sum them over. You have an equation, you can solve it. So uh, for effective potential, people usually use the standard procedure. So you go from uh, generating functional Legendre transformation, then you have effective action. And uh, effective potential is just the beginning of effective action, which doesn't depend on momenta. But in practice, what you do, you just do it like the ground field. You take the action of your model, you shift the field, uh, quantum field plus, plus classical one, 
and you integrate over the quantum field and you expand over the classical one and the first term of expansion is just the effective potential. So that means that when the arbitrary theory like this, so you have a kinetic term and some potential, which may be anything, and then you consider the vacuum diagram. So you can see the vacuum diagram that look like here, but external legs are classical. So expand over them. So if you have a potential, you shift the, um, the argument and expand over the Taylor expansion. And you have uh, a sequence of diagrams. And this notation is that Vn is just the derivative of the classical potential over the field. So these are what's standing in the vertices. So you have to sum up all these terms to all orders of perturbation theory. That can be done with the help of this generalized RG equation. So um, then the divergences which you get, these all diagrams are divergent. We use dimensional regularization, so you one over epsilon terms. And these divergences are linked to the uh, log behavior. And so you see that, for instance, one loop diagram, these are external legs. And so you calculate this diagram is divergent, one over epsilon. And then this is, you can expand over epsilon. You see that you have one over epsilon term and log of uh, mu square over m square. But m square is, is not a constant. m square is, a, is field dependent because it's the second derivative of the, effect, of the classical potential. So you, and this basically is log of phi. So what you want to get, you want to sum up all the leading terms of log of phi, which you can do this way. So as I say, but we're hunting for divergences because it's one-to-one -one corresponding between leading divergences and leading, uh, leading logs. So if you know how to sum up, sum up the leading divergences, you know how to sum the leading logs. So one goes after another. And to calculate the leading divergences, you have to calculate in n loops the terms like one over epsilon to the n. And how you do it? You do, you use this the renormalization operators, uh, operation, and as I said, this one over epsilon to the n terms are linked to one over epsilon in one loop. So you can use it. If you know one loop, you can calculate all of them algebraically. So this is the, again, the demonstration of the R operation. <coughs> For this vacuum diagrams, this is vacuum diagram in n loops, and you have this expansion with, uh, with subdivergences subtracted in one loop, two loop, up to n minus one loop. And what is needed is just one loop live diagram and n minus loop counter term. And you can write down the recurrence relation. So you have to look what is standing in the vertices. What is standing in the vertices is just derivatives of the classical potential. And then, you, again, you make this expansion, you have all these derivatives, infinite number of derivatives, but they all are just expansion of the potential. So the recurrence relations which you get as a result of it is written here. So Sn is the leading divergence is n loop. Sn minus one is the leading divergence is n minus one loop. And this is just derivative. So D2 is a differential operator, second derivative with respect to a field. And this is a recurrence relations, which is valid for n equal starting from two loops. In fact, you can even write it starting from one loop this way. You see it's nonlinear relation, but if you know it's in one loop, you calculate it in two loops and three loops and so on and so forth, pure algebraically, because they're all linked. And you can uh, transform this recurrence relation into differential equation. So this differential equation, if you take a sum, so again, this is the leading divergence in n loops. You sum them over. You have one over epsilon. G is the coupling. And then for this function, you get a differential equation. So this is a master differential equation. So the derivative with respect to the coupling. This is derivative with respect to the field. This is a boundary condition. This is a classical potential, arbitrary one. And this is RG equation for arbitrary potential, even if a non-renormalizable case. So to get the effective potential, you just take the solution of this equation and make a substitution. So instead of one over epsilon, you substitute this log term. Now, so now you have to solve this equation somehow. Let me show you how it works in some particular example. For instance, you take power-like potential, phi to the power of pi, right? Then this coupling has dimension, negative dimension. So the, in fact, the dimensionless variable is g times pi to pi minus four. And that means that this function, which I'm looking for, 
uh, can be written in the following form. So this is a classical potential times some function of dimensionless variable. And for this function f, you have the following differential equation. This is a general differential equation, but rather tricky, I must say. It's a second order nonlinear differential equation with this boundary condition. So let's take the simplest case, which is a renormalizable case, p equal 4, to, phi to the fourth theory. Then you see that these two terms drop, and your equation is here. And you can recognize a very well-known uh, RRG equation for the leading logs in phi to the fourth theory in four dimensions. And of course, the solution is geometrical progression. And this is the effective potential, which is summing up. We'll look at the seven, 1973 paper of Coleman and Weinberg. This is, this is it. And so, of course, it's, sorry, and this, um, and this potential has a Landau pole every, here. And so this is the one loop, or, or it's not one loop, it's all loops, but leading order uh, contribution of quantum correction to effective potential. But what is interesting to us now is not to consider p equal to four case, but some, some other case, in, for instance, to consider p is greater than four. And if p is greater than four, all the, these two terms survive. And so this equation becomes very complicated, in fact, for analytical solution. So we didn't find the analytical solution, we find some numerical solution. So we take, uh, in order to do it, we found out that there is some singularity. So it's better to, to change the variables, to go with the function u instead of f. This is equation for a function u, which has some discontinuity in the solution. You see this function f numerical. This is a numerical solution. It has some discontinuity here. So in p equal four case and phi to the fourth theory, we had an infinite uh, gap because we have Landau pole. Here, instead of infinite gap, we have a finite gap, we have some discontinuity in, in the solution. And so for the cases of p equal five or six, this is uh, this, so this blue curve is what you get numerically. So in the, that was the classical potential. And this blue part is uh, what you get like a result of summation of all other superturbation theory. You have a potential with a, uh, with a discontinuity. So the state which is here happened to be metastable in fact. So it looks like that this discontinuity is a general feature of this kind of equation. Uh, at, okay, maybe it's not good. It gives you this uh, metastable state. Uh, the question, of course, is whether your approximation, leading log approximation, is valid. Uh, up to which uh, value of the field is valid? Can you trust this discontinuity in general? But, you know, for Landau Paul, the situation is the same. It's just summation of the leading terms. And you can always say what happens if you consider non-leading terms, whether this Landau Paul survives or not. And we still don't quite know what it is. So see here, it's similar. But instead of Landau Paul, you have finite discontinuity. It looks like that it is within the validity of approximation. So probably you can trust the statement that there is a discontinuity and the state is actually metastable. Uh, well. Uh, Okay, this is some words about discontinuity. Let me skip it. And so another example which you can see this is the exponential potential. It might be interesting for cosmological applications. In some other cases, you know, people in cosmology, since they deal with gravity, they don't care so much about renormalizability. They just play with all this potential. But what is interesting is what are quantum corrections to potential. So this is exactly what we are trying to do. So we can see that, like example, this exponential form. Then equation looks like this. Again, you see it's a second order differential equation, nonlinear one. And again, we have a discontinuity of numerical solution. And so this blue curve is this quantum potential. You see it's a gap. Here again, the discontinuity. And again, this metastable state, similar to the phi to the five or phi to the six case. So, okay, so I finish more or less with what I wanted to say. These are some of my um, conclusions. So that uh, what I'm trying to deliver to you that in even in non renormalizable cases, you can make some statements which do not depend on the arbitrariness of a theory. So the leading terms are sensible and you can sum them over and you can generalize the usual RJ equation for this non renormalizable case and sum up all orders of perturbation theory. And some interesting examples uh, are here. 
In general, these solution, these equations are partial differential equations because there are two arguments there. So a partial differential equations still they can be solved numerically. What I have shown you, I have shown you the solutions in case when everything is reduced to ordinary differential equation. But in general, it's a partial differential equation. But still, you can work with them. And uh, my resume is with I'm not going going to go through all this. My general resume is that non denormalizable interaction is some still something you can approach. Sometimes you can say, look at this girl, you cannot really even imagine that approaching her, but sometimes it works. So it, it might work. Thank you very much. Of course, uh, one, I mean, people, uh, my, my name is Apostolos Pilapsis, uh, just to, uh, uh, there are other people who have worked also similar uh, summations like in a 2PI, two particle reducible um, framework to obtain uh, improved effective potentials. So the question uh, I have to you is uh, whether in your approach, uh, you also studied the mu dependence. I mean, that's the usual thing, the mu dependence of your effective potential. Mu dependence, of course. Well, uh, mu is in, under this log argument. So in a, in a, um, uh, in a leading approximation, of course, it log dependence on this mu. We know that in higher orders, when people try to go to higher orders, they try to reduce it somehow. You want to have it flat, of course. You want to have it flat using higher orders or some improvement. So we didn't try this at, at all. I mean, we didn't even try it here. So here is just pure log dependence. But this is the way how you get to no, you have to go further. I agree. Yeah, but when you go further in non renormalizable cases, start depending on the way how you subtract divergence on this arbitrariness. So it's not that pure case. Like in the... Okay, we understand. It. Ah, look, uh, in general relativity, of course, people will ask you how you actually control this arbitrariness, which I don't know how to control. So I wonder what I'm going to say that probably in an application like cosmology, when people want to consider some arbitrary potentials rather than the normalizable, that can be used for this case. But then they somehow ignore this this big problem. I don't, I have to ignore it as well. I mean, I'm just trying to, to deal with something which doesn't depend on this big problem. If there are no questions, I yes. have to please answer to this. Jean-Marie just, you, you seem to be finding alternate minima outside of the uh, origin. Uh, is that essentially unbounded from below and hopeless? Or could it be the indication that uh, the theory is pointing us at uh, another stable uh, minimum? You know, the original aim was like in Coleman Weinberg paper to, to find some extra minima. But you know that in spite of the first theory, this doesn't happen. That's why in their famous paper, they considered quantum uh, scalar electrodynamics where the, with the relation of some couplings, you can get this extra minima. In this particular case, it doesn't happen. We don't have any extra minima. So my statement is that if you just consider these models of this type, uh, this extra minima doesn't appear. Fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know. So it doesn't appear. Rather, we have a metastable state. So in order to get a possibility to get extra minima, you probably have also, like Coleman Weinberg, to, ex to add something extra and try to apply the same technique for this more complicated model, which we didn't try so far. Thank you for your talk. It's Sasha Bile from Southampton. Dima, uh, a question about how the discontinuities, uh, is there any physical sense of it and how they would modify in the uh, loop maybe? Well, or <laughs> well, I don't know. Actually, this uh, equation looks, uh, it's non-linear and at the same time, it's rather simple, I would say. So uh, whether this uh, equation always will have a discontinuity, I don't know. That is what we got. If 
but we got it numerically. I don't know any uh, any so analytical deri deri derivation of this. So it's, it's something which is a bit shaky. Thank you. Mateo. This goes in the same direction. I was wondering, you know, whether you try to do an expansion around the singular points or something. Well, I mean, you, it, it looks simple well, enough that one yeah, should you be know, able to. We, we did, we did. It's expansion over the small uh, argue, well, function of x. It's a Taylor expansion over x, but one over x, it doesn't work. And so, in fact, I have no good analytical or even approximate approach. Uh, that bothers me. That's so you cannot. You cannot simplify the differential equation in the vicinity of the jump or something? No, no not at the moment. <laughs> this bothers me as well. Is there Of <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm to make this day, I think. Yeah. I got it. Okay. Okay. So, so thanks, thanks very much for the invitation to be here. It, this is the first time I've uh, I've been abroad for a couple of years for obvious reasons, and uh, it's always nice to find myself suddenly in a new, in a new place. But it's particularly nice to find myself in a, in a very, very, very lovely new place. So, uh, so thanks. Uh, so, so this is this is work I, I've been doing with Vicky Vicky Osborne, but also with a, an ex-student, Colin Poole, and, and also Tom Spoidner, who is a, a postdoc at uh, Sussex. So, uh, what I'm going, what I'm trying to do here is, is just to explain how how we've been looking to get constraints on the RG renormalization group functions for uh, for uh, general scalar fermion theories. So the, the, the renormalization group or RG functions for, for pure scalar theories and are known to very high loop orders, uh, so I think six loops now, and also the RG functions for, uh, for supersymmetric theories, particularly the Western Wiener model, are, are also known to high loops. And in fact, there's a recent calculation by John Gracie to five loops. But the, the beta functions for a general four-dimensional scalar fermion theory uh, have only recently been derived at three loops, and even then by uh, rather indirect arguments rather than by you know, direct uh, graph calculations. And what, are, what I'm going to do here is, is to try, is to write, try to use, uh, to show how do you, we can use the mere existence of superspheric theories to, to constrain the general results, and hopefully this is another, another way of trying to get an uh, efficient way of calculating uh, RG functions for these Fermion scalar theories. I'll, I'll start by looking at the uh, n, n equals one supersymmetry and show how that, that can give some constraints on uh, these general RG functions. But in fact, what we what we found is is that uh, n equals one supersymmetry in four dimensions it, it isn't isn't very helpful. It does it doesn't impose all that many constraints. But it, it, it turns out there's another theory, uh, what's called a gross of Yukawa theory uh, in, in four dimensions. It's another scalar fermion theory in four dimensions. Uh, it's got n. We can it can have uh, n phi scalars, and it also has a quarter of n phi Dirac fermions. And it turns out that this is not superspheric in four dimensions, but it, it is. It does have a superspheric fixed point in terms of the epsilon expansion, corresponding to a, a three-dimensional uh, superspheric superspheric theory. And this is this has been called emergent supersymmetry. We 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 call it n equals half supersymmetry. 
uh, like I say, Argulis, that's, that's uh, not, not a very helpful name. But anyway, it turns out that we can, we can use this to impose constraints on these, on, on these uh, theories. And that's really what I, what I want to explain here. It, it can be, you can use up to three loops, uh, but I want to make this a fairly pedagogical talk, so I'll, I'll just explain what happens up to, up to two loops. And we'll find this, 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 this pins down a lot, a lot of, a lot of the uh, beat functions in, in the theory. So I'm, I'm going to look at a, a, a general renormalizable fermion scalar theory in four dimensions. So it's, so it's, it's got uh, scalar fields and, and fermion fields with the Yukawa and, and cortex scalar interactions. And um, the, the scalar fields are represented by dotted lines and, and the fermion fields by, by, uh, by full lines. Uh, here's the Yukawa interactions and here's the, the cortex scalar interactions. And normally you'd think of these as being, um, these are being the propagators and, and these would be the vertices in the Feynman diagrams. But I, I'm going to be using this as part of a diagrammatic notation for the, uh, for the tensor structures that appear in these, in these general theories. So in, 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 I'll be thinking of this as being a, a contraction of indices, uh, a scalar indices, this is being a contraction of fermion indices, and then these will be tensor structures appearing in the general renormalization group functions. I just want to remind you that the, the Yukawa beta function, um, Yukawa beta function can be written as a sum of one partially reducible contributions, and I'll, I'll call those beta tilde, and then there will also be contributions to the anomalous dimensions, the scalar anomalous dimension and the, and the fermion anomalous dimension. And I'll be using a, a matrix notation for the fermion uh, terms. So, so these, the, there's matrix multiplications going on here and here and with, with, the fermi, with the fermion anomalous dimensions. And then similarly, there's a, there's a, a, a similar uh, expression for the scalar potential with, with one particle reducible diagrams and, and then also uh, I almost mentioned contributions. As I say, I, I, I'm going to use a diagrammatic notation for these general tensor structures. So here, here for instance, is the one loop uh, anomalous, scalar anomalous dimension. So get this term here is, is, a, is a number which comes from doing the Feynman diagram calculation. So we, 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 we compute the Feynman diagram, extract the pole term, and, and then use that to, uh, to give the contribution to the one loop anomalous dimension. And then this is the, this is the um, tensor structure that occurs in a the general theory. And, I'm gonna, and this is what I'm going to represent in a diagrammatic form. So this, so this diagram here, which it looks like a Feynman diagram, but, it, but it's really a, a, a compact notation for this tensor structure. So the, the, uh, the lines here represent the contractions between the tensor structures, the contraction between the fermion, fermion indices in this, in this trace, and, um, and the, the, blue line, the blue blobs here represent the two interactions, the two tensor structures that occur, occur here. So I'm just, I'm just going to quickly show all, all the, all the, two, all the uh, diagrams that occur of the tulips, just to show you how many there are of them, really. So these are the these are the contributions to the to the one and two loop um, scalar. Oops, didn't mean to go that way. These are the the one loop and the two loop contributions to the scalar anomalous dimension, and the one and two loop contributions to the to the um, fermion anomalous dimensions. And again, these these uh, these look like the Feynman diagrams, but in fact, the results of the Feynman diagrams are, are, are packaged into these numbers here, and, and these just represent the general tensor structures that occur. And what we want, what, what I'm trying to do is, is to show how to constrain these, these numbers, how to, how, to get, how to get constraints on these numbers without doing any calculation. And then here's one particle irreducible Yukawa contributions at, at, uh, at one and at two loops. And then here's the um, here's a similar contributions at one and two loops to the to the scalar 
potential for what the four point scale of potential. So I'm, I'm, because there's a, there's rather a lot of diagrams here, I'm going to try to sh illustrate the general procedure by uh, looking at a simpler theory. In fact, a, a, U, a theory with a U1 invariance, and also that'll that'll naturally lead on to looking at the constraints from the n equals one supersymmetry. So, to look at to, to consider a U1 case, we 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 consider complex fields. So so the um, the scalar field decomposes into two complex components, and the the scalar potential decomposes into uh, into two phi contributions and two and two phi bar two phi bar terms. And now the the kinetic term just links the phi and the phi bar. So so correspondingly the the uh, the, the contractions just link phi and phi bar fields, uh, and also the Yukawa couplings are, are either purely Phi, phi interactions or purely phi bar interactions. As I said, the scale, the, uh, the scale of potential has two incoming phi's and two outgoing phi's. So, the, so the, the, the number of diagrams now gets drastically reduced. There's only there's only three contributions. There's, sorry, there's um, there's a, 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 there's now only two two loop contributions to the scalar and two two loop contributions to the fermion anomalous dimension and in fact there's no one loop there's no one loop one one pi contribution that to the uh, yukawa potential and just two two loop contributions i'm not going to show the scalar diagrams because they, they actually don't get very much reduced in fact they they actually get more complicated because there's several different ways to assign the arrows in the in the scalar case so now now i'm going to try to impose constraints on these numbers using uh, n equals one supersymmetry. So in the, in the n equals one supersymmetric case, of course we equate the number of scalar and fermion fields and, and so the indices all become identified as there's just a single, a single type of index for the, uh, for the Yukawa couplings, uh, capital Y. And also in the, in the n equals one case, the scalar, the scalar potential is written in as a contraction of two Yukawa, Yukawa couplings. And diagrammatically, that, that, looks, that looks like this. Now, there's now a single field represented by a continuous line. And the, the, scalar, the scalar interaction now, now looks like, like, like this, with a contraction of, of, of two fields. So when we, when we impose supersymmetry, um, of course, we, we then find that the, the scalar and the fermion anomalous dimensions both, both become equal. Uh, I call that gamma s. Uh, and in fact, there's only a single contribution to gamma s at one loop and a, a single contribution at two loops. The non-renormalization non theorem says that there's no one, one pi contributions to the, to the Yukawa potential renormalization. And then the, um, the Renormalization, sorry, the renormalization group uh, invariance of this of this equation demands that the beta, the scalar and the Yukawa in, uh, interactions have to be related by this equation. Let's get, sorry, let's get this, the scalar the scalar one pi one pi beta function has to be right, has to be written like this in order to preserve this this, uh, this form for the for the potential. Uh, scalar potential. So di diagrammatically, this, 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 it, the constraints mostly come from the expression for the scalar potential. This, this, um, this, oops. The constraints mostly come from this equation here for the scalar potential. And they look like this. The, here, here's the general form for the one-loop scalar potential. And when we impose the, the supersymmetric form for the scalar potential, the, these interactions get, get written like, like this and, and, and like this. And we just get these two, we, we get two, two topologies like uh, of, of this form. This one, this, 
this diagram doesn't appear in doesn't appear in a supersymmetric case, so this is going to vanish, and this one has to be identified with um, with this contribution here. So you get you get some you get, you get a couple of constraints. Um, Firstly, this 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 uh, term here has to vanish, and also that this this term here has to be has to be equal to the anomalous, to the one loop anomalous dimension. So you so you get these two these two constraints here, in addition to the equality of the anomalous dimensions for the fermions and scalars. So we start we started out with with four one loop coefficients in the original U one theory, but the, the mere existence of the supersymmetric theory has, has now imposed altogether three constraints on the on the coefficients in the, in the original theory, and so in, in the U one case, there's only there's only one coefficient left to be determined. There's only, there's only one final diagram calculation you have to do to to obtain the, the full one loop beta function. So and and, and 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 in fact, if you if you imagine it, you'd also you'd also done the one loop um, supersymmetric calculation, then that would also determine this final remaining coefficient. So so the so the supersymmetry, the supersymmetric theory, in, in a sense, determines the whole of the one loop uh, beta functions. But things work, things don't work out quite as well at two loops. At two loops, it turns out that, that we get we get this set of conditions. I'm not going to go into full detail here, but uh, the the six constraints here on the original beta function coefficients, and eleven two loop coefficients altogether in the U1 case, and so there's still five U1 coefficients left left undetermined. So we so we've only really halved the number of of uh, of, um, of uh, parameters left to be determined. So this is this is the motivation for, 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 for trying to use this this uh, this, this uh, n equals half so-called supersymmetric super theory. This this is a special case of the of the real uh, general scalar fermion theory, uh, and it was introduced by I think first of all by Phi, Phi John B. Klebanov and Tarnopolsky, and then various other people have also com considered it, uh, including Leander and Rong. So this is this is a, a real theory, and um, once again we have the same number of fermion and scalar indices, and once again we have a similar expression for the scalar potential in terms of the Yukawa couplings. And it turns out that in the in the case of a two-component Majorana fermion, this is this is n equals one supersymmetric, but in, in three dimensions. But we we can access this. Uh, Supersymmetric theory formally from four dimensions by by working out the RG functions in four dimensions and then doing an epsilon and then in principle doing an epsilon expansion around, around four dimensions and we can we can do this by by formally taking a quarter of the number of a quarter n five Dirac fermions where n five the number of scalars and of course this it, it, oops. Right, too far ahead there. Of course, if 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 n phi is one, for instance, this is a fraction. This is a fraction. And if n phi is two, this this is this is a fraction. But nevertheless, we can we can do this formally just by modif modifying the Fermi firm trace appropriately. And this is and this is what we're going to imagine doing. So now, now the, the 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 usual four dimensional. Realization theorem, the non-realization theorem doesn't doesn't apply. So there, there will be one pi contributions to the Yukawa beta function. And so now our, our one loop constraints now now look like this for, for the for the scalar potential. The, these two one loop scalar potential contributions uh, when you specialize to this to this. Uh, N equals a half supersymmetric case look look like this. So they, they, these two diagrams are similar to the ones we had before, but now there's an, addi an additional Yukawa. Um, there's an additional um, diagram with a, with a three-point Yukawa contribution. And once again, when you in, when you impose the 
SUSE constraints, uh, particularly, the, particularly the one coming from the RG invariance of this relationship, you get, you get a set of constraints which, uh, which constrain the original one loop, one loop coefficients in the, in the general theory. And here, um, gamma of S, the supersymmetric one loop anomalous dimension, um, It comes from this diagram and the and one loop um, Yukawa uh, beta function comes from this comes from this diagram in the n equals the half theory. So now we now we 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 now have five one loop coefficients to determine in, in the general theory, and we we've, we've got four n equals a half constraints, one one more than we had in the n equals one case. So we're once again we're down to requiring one one coefficient to be determined. So that's, that's not much better than we had in the n equals one case at one, at one loop. But, in, but it, things get much better at, at two loops. We we get more we get more constraints, uh, partly because the partly because the original n equals half beta function sorry the original general scalar Fermi beta function is is not super is not symmetric in its indices, whereas the n equals a half super, super symmetric beta function has to be symmetric in its indices, and that, that gives you several additional constraints. And so it, at two loops, we, we, get, we get these constraints for the Yukawa beta function being symmetric. And we, we once again get a number of constraints from the two loop scalar potential being um, have, having the RG invariance. And so we start with 19 two-loop coefficients in the general theory, and we have, but we actually get 15 constraints from the mere existence of the n equals a half supersymmetry, and that just leaves four two-loop coefficients left to be left to be determined. And in fact, it also turns out that uh, there's a superfield formalism for the n, for the n equals a half theory, so which is quite efficient in terms of doing the two-loop calculations, and so the remaining four-loop coefficients can also be Simply calculated by doing some superfield calculations in the in the n equals half theory. So you can actually pin pin down the whole general Fermi scalar beta function quite efficiently. Right, if there's a couple of minutes, I've got a couple of minutes. I just want to talk a bit more about um, additional constraints from the from the a, a function. So it's. it's it's sort of generally accepted now, I think, that the that the Zamologic of C theorem in, in two dimensions has an extension to four dimensions, which is called the A theorem. And the, the, the A theorem implies the existence of a function called the A function, which is which behaves monotonically between RG fixed points. And there's a, there's a strong version of the A theorem, um, which stipulates that the the derivative of the A function is proportional to the, to the beta functions for the, the theory. And this could also be used to, to impose constraints on the, on the enormous dimension. So just put, just put, put a little bit more flesh on that. On that. Uh, also, it was he, he also, in fact, that, that showed explicitly that, that uh, for a general theory with coupling G, you can find a function whose derivative with respect to the couplings is, is, is proportional to the to the beta functions like, like this. And you, you can hope, you can ask the question as to whether the existence of the A function also imposes constraints on the beta function coefficients. Sanino and his collaborators, Antipin and uh, et al, uh, mentioned that this was possible, but uh, it, was, it was shown explicitly by by Poole and Thompson and Stoyner that you could actually impose, use these use these constraints to to uh, to derive the full free loop uh, scalar fermion beta function in general. But 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 combined with other information from standard model calculations at, at three loops. And in fact, it turns out that that that. Uh, one loop and uh, two loops, uh, sorry, one loop, there's, there's no constraints from the existence of the A function, but there's four constraints at two loops. 
but only two, only two of these are independent of those, of those we've, we've already found. And so the A function just, just reduces the number of unknown coefficients by two. And, and so we, we're, down to, we're down to two loop, to, to two, two loop coefficients undetermined in the, in the general theory. At, th at three loops, which is, in, which is, the, the, which is the theory we're most interested in, is that there's 143 coefficients there's 106 n equals half uh, conditions and 42 conditions from the A function. But it's not, it's not clear what overlap there is at the moment between those n equals half conditions and the A function co conditions. So we, we don't actually yet know how many coefficients are unconstrained in, in the three loops. But nevertheless, this gives a lot, a lot of information towards computing the full general, uh, the full general beta function. So I'll just, uh, I'll skip that, I think, this time's running out. So just to conclude, the, the, the existence of n equals one supersymmetry and even, even more n equals a half supersymmetry can be used to determine a majority of the coefficients in the RG functions up to up the three loops, especially when augmented with the existence of the A function. You can also, we can also use the A function uh, to, to constrain the, Supersymmetric beta function, the, the beta function for the n equals one supersymmetric theory, and um, more than more than this, there's actually an explicit form for the a function uh, which has been proposed and which seems to work at least up to, up to four loops. And currently, we're 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 well. John John Gracie has worked out the uh, n equals n equals one almost bench up to up to five loops, and and the, 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 so, so currently. We've, uh, we're, we're looking at seeing whether his uh, beta function is, is consistent with the, with, the a, with the A function constraints and this general form for the, for the A function in the, in the A equals one theory. So, thank you. early on in the stuff on n equals one supersymmetry and its constraints you know you there are arrows on the fermion lines so had had you had you also done the analysis using Majorana fermions when you know i wouldn't be putting arrows on fermion lines then to, to well we, I mean? we, we were interested at that, at that point in well the Part of the motivation at that point was was to, was 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 just to simplify the theory, and part mm. and partly the motivation was was to um, was to specialise n equals one. Yeah, well, I'm talking about n equals one. I mean, you know, the the Weston's amino first formulated n equals one using Majorana fermions, and and then, I, you know, it's not a big deal. I, I yeah. just thought then there'd no, no, be we, no we, arrows we, on the fermions. No, we we, so. we not looked at that that that, oh, okay. that way of doing. Okay. I think you might sit there. Anyway, I want to thank the organizers for having invited me to be in this uh, meeting that uh, is fantastic, you know. We are, we are already 40 years old, according to George, I think it's a remarkable date. And I dedicate my talk to our uh, friend, Graham, who has left us, unfortunately, and uh, who has done pioneering work in this question of uh, BCKM and quark masses and mixing. 
So the title of my talk is uh, Do Small Numbers in VCKM Arise from New Physics? This is something different, at least maybe nonsense, we may consider that it is a too, too wild uh, hypothesis, but it is certainly different. As far as I know, no one has ever said that VCKM already has new physics, okay? At least the originality we have, okay? Now, now you will then in the end judge if it's a good idea or not. Uh, so the organization will talk is first identification of small numbers. I talk about small numbers, I should say what small, small numbers. Then the conjecture is that the small numbers in this game arise from new physics. And, and the new physics that I'm going to give as an example, but by the conjecture itself, it's, I think goes beyond the, the idea of a vector like quartz. The, the example, the specific example goes that with identification of new physics with the vector like fairness. Okay. I tell you in terms of propaganda, vector like fairness are fairness that have uh, that you, where you can write a mass, it's, it's gauge invariant. You know, it's, they are cousins of right-handed neutrinos. As you know, right-handed neutrinos are there and are the most plausible, in my point of view, explanation for the smallness of, uh, of the neutrino masses. And they were put in their, in their pocket. You know, I remember I was a graduate student at City College and Marshall is, is to ask the question, why did the people from Harvard, you know, Weinberg, Sam put the right hand of neutrino in their pocket, you know, which is true. Why? Why, why to eliminate new R? It's there, you know. Even the, the philosophy was right, the most general uh, Lagrangian consistent with normalizability and uh, uh, gauge invariance. New R is there, you know. You, you only put in the pocket if you want to have massless neutrinos. That's a dogma that was wrong. We know that. And it's this dogma that eliminated the standard model. The standard model has been ruled out, point. Now some people say, well, I consider the standard model is new as I, I think it's be not rigorous because the standard model is the one model that was suggested and it has been ruled out. So now I, we make this uh, conjecture, let me see. Now uh, I will give you an example of vector like quarks as uh, being a possibility of uh, the origin of new physics in this again. And then we'll, we'll treat some phenomenological consequences and draw the conclusion. No, identification of small numbers. I mean, just a numerical thing. Small numbers in VCKM are the PUB, you know, which is small, and the imaginary of Q, which means the strength of CP biology. These things are not independent. In other words, as you know, although if PUB goes to zero, uh, I also goes to zero. The opposite is not true. If VUB is different from zero, you may have. Uh, the phase equal to zero. So, uh, the what? Yeah, uh, this Q is. I'm sorry. I must have dropped this uh, Q is uh, a rephasing variant coordinate. Anyone that you want the rephasing variant in the BCKM, you have moduli and rephase invariant quantities. These are the important quantities. You may say, what about a higher function V? Higher function V, you can prove that it can be written in terms of quartets and moduli. So in this VCKM, only quartets and moduli are important. And it is a well-known fact that in the SM, the measure of Q is at the same value for all quartets, okay? Now, uh, I'm just giving some small details that are very well known, but just a matter of, of completeness. Uh, for example, let, let us take the case of, uh, of this very nice quartet that you can see that it's lambda, lambda square, lambda cube. This is one lambda cube, lambda to the six. So imaginary of Q is equal to lambda six multiplied by the sign of the arm of some quartet, okay? Uh, now the quartets here that, that are, can be of order one because actually uh, image of Q is, is of order lambda six. So, so you can see that there are some rephasing invariant angles in the standard model that can be large. This is what we, we, we have as uh, identified as gamma and, uh, and thing. Now a very uh, true uh, result but is surprising. You can prove that uh, in the in the three cross three corner of 
of a VCKM matrix of arbitrary size, you know, because now we're thinking of vector I quartz, you can, this need to be three by three, but you can prove it that, uh, think of arbitrary size, you have only four phase invariant phases, okay? Things don't get complicated in this three by three corner. How did you get the, the four phase invariant? It's just counting. You, know, you have nine phases and you can eliminate the number of phases is five. You know, independent of number generation of vector like quartz, always, so you, in the end, you will have a three cross three corner, only four phases. Uh, our, th that we know already in the standard model gamma and beta, and then what we uh, identify as beta kappa, relevant for CP violation in the KM sector, and this one relevant for, for B, uh, CP violation in, in the BSPS by mixing and so on, okay? So, so you have, uh, no, the, the rephase invariant phases that I'm talking about are uh, the gamma, beta, beta S, you know, and beta kappa. Sometimes one also introduces alpha as like this, but this is redundant. It's not necessary because by definition, alpha is equal to pi minus beta minus gamma. By definition, so you see, in the beginning, people used to say that checking unitarity of the, of, the, of the VCKM by checking whether alpha plus beta plus gamma is equal to pi. That is nonsense because it's by definition that alpha is in that alpha plus beta plus gamma is equal to pi. Okay. No. Now. Uh, uh, within. Uh, the SM, it's a very nice, I like these expressions very much because within the SM, uni just unitarity uh, gives you the, the possibility of relating physical quantities. Like, for example, VUB divided by VTD is equal to that. You know, you, you may seem that this is irrelevant. No, it is very important, this relation, because you see, if we get a gamma, which maybe will not be at, my, at least in my age, you know, at my life. The gamma is measured with incredible precision. Beta is getting, getting measured better and better precision. You can get a, a measurement of VUB, you know, very competitive. You know, you can really, by unitarity, derive very, with greater accuracy by VUB. And also, you can also derive, this, all these are exact relationships. A relationship is beta S and beta, okay, this one. And beta cap, of course, this is very small. And it has to be very small because of this relationship. Even if gamma is of order one, uh, this you, you get this beta kappa extremely small. So, so there's more of uh, Yes, yes, VUS, yes, I forgot the model, yes, yes. Anyway, I'm making just a propaganda about what? The conjecture that I'm making, you know, that is certainly different. No one, I, as far as I know, okay, no one has ever said that PCKM already has new physics. Is that VUB, you know, VUB and uh, and imagine or uh, TP violation arise from new physics? Okay, a particular realization of the conjecture is with, with vector like quartz, but does not need to be vector like quartz. Okay, so the uh, so a crucial question is what I mean. Since I'm going to solve the problem with the uh, track to solve the problem with vector like quartz, I address myself to the question: What can uh, vector like works do for you. And uh, one thing that I, I mean, you may like, you, you may prefer Peche Queen solution to the strong CPR problem, but there are other types of solutions, in particular uh, the, the class of models Barry and Nelson have suggested, and we have a very simple realization of that model. And vector like works provide that possibility. They provide also this a simple extension. Of the SM with spontaneous CP violation in a model consistent with the experiment. Because you may think that, okay, uh, VCKM is, is complex. So you may say, well, that means that the car couplings are complex. Wrong. It does not mean. Because this complex you call couplings may be generated by a phase in the back. Okay? And the model can be consistent provided the complex VCKM is uh, generated. In other words, provide this phase in the back, you can generate a complex VCKM because that is already proved by experiment, and that is possible. So vector like quarks provide this very nice possibility. Uh, I mean, I'm just reminding, 
uh, that uh, uh, it is not trivial to build a model with spontaneous CP violations that is in agreement with the experiment. First, you have to make sure that your your uh, uh, the, the, that uh, your vacuum violates CP, and that is uh, non trivial maybe non trivial because there sometimes there are models, for example, based on S3, where you appear two pi over three phase, four pi over three phase. These vacuum, although they are penetrated, they look like CP violating, they are not CP violating. But you, you may have a really, truly a CP violating phase, and then you have to, to make sure then that this vacuum phase should be able to generate a complex CKM meter, because that experiment tells us that the CKM is complex, so you cannot avoid that, okay? And that is non-trivial. Again, vector-like works provide that possible, the simplest possibility, okay? Uh, they also provide very new phenomena, like we did contribution. We all see these fits of the of the of an unitary triangle. In these fits, they are a little bit changed. If there are new contributions for BDBD by mixing, the SPS by mixing, all this leads to the, as you probably know, do, those who have been working. Instead of beta, you have beta bar. Instead of uh, uh, beta s, you get beta s bar, and so on. Okay, so new contributions. Uh, and it may lead also to very exciting uh, uh, decays, like T going, can go to C that Z mu. So this may receive three level contributions in models with uptype vector life forms. Okay, so now uh, another thing, I am very uh, sad that, uh, that uh, Pierre Ramon is not here because, you know, uh, he is a very close collaborator, as you know, of uh, Graham, and uh, I, w I was hoping to see him here. Now, he, 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 I think as far as I know, he, he is the first one that says, wrote a paper, uh, famines in the desert, you know? And, and that is very important because uh, famine-like uh, vector-like quarks may populate the desert between V and the highest scale, M or whatever you want, without making, uh, worsening the hierarchy problem, because fermions have a chirality to protect. So you may have the desert populated with the uh, fermions. So that's the paper, very old paper by Ramon, says fermions in the, that, in the desert, you know, talk even at Elysia some years ago, which is very nice. I mean, if, if we don't have a new physics, you know, at least the vector-like fermions can be there, you know, I mean, Fermions in the desert can be a possibility. Okay? It is not a very exciting one if they are very heavy, but it's better than having a desert, a total desert. Okay? So now, uh, VLQs can also solve uh, the. Uh, we don't know really for sure that there is a CKM unitarity problem. Okay? So when, when I have doubts about things, I ask my friends, some of my friends who are specialists. So I ask. Uh, um, Bill Marciano, you know, whether this unitarity problem of BCKM is serious or not. And he told me that he's not very happy with it, but it is serious. So I can encourage young people to work on the, on the thing. So we, we try to, to solve this problem with, the, with vector like works, this group of people in Lisbon, Penedo, uh, young postdoc, and the student, and Rebelo, who is here. We wrote this paper introducing vector like works to explain why there is this. Essentially, this doesn't count for anything, you know, but why this can be uh, less than one, okay? Uh, now, uh, yeah, I just described it, that I asked Bill Marciano if this is serious, and he says yes, that it was serious. So, so the. Now let me go to a specific model where you can have a generation of V UB and imaginary part of Q from new physics, okay? You see, this is something very drastic, you know, that I'm uh, uh, proposing, that we are proposing, because all the people that worked very hard to try to find out to generate a good PCKM out of symmetries and so on, they, they, are, they will be missing a point because uh, they will draw, want to, to uh, construct derive that from symmetries. Now, what we are saying, this is not possible because VCKM is not only comes not only from SM, but some new physics. So, it will not be possible, okay? So, so what, what does, uh, what uh, our conjecture about 
VCKM, effective VCKM, is that some part comes from the apps, of course. This is like the standard, uh, uh, standard matrix, standard uh, parameterization of CKM. But, but what we are, say, we are saying is that this VCKM effective, some part comes from the up, other parts from the down. This is nothing wrong. But then the new physics comes all uh, here from this mixing, S13, and the phase. So this is our hypothesis, that VCKM, it's already showing us uh, new uh, physics, okay? So that is, uh, it, it changes completely. The, the possibility of trying to derive a good VCKM, you know, without taking this into account, if, you, if we are right, it's impossible because uh, uh, SM will only give you this and that. And actually, it's easier to find models two by two, you know, the, the symmetries that lead so two by two good matrices. I mean, I, the most famous case is the matrix that in two by dimension, in two generations, that the, the, the leads to very successful formula, theta kbb equal to square root over md over ms. That can be derived very easily in, in, in uh, two by two matrices, okay? Now, uh, so this is our, our assumption. So, let, let me give you how you can obtain that. So you're going to have a symmetries that lead to a MD of, of this type. You know, the, 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 the down quark mass matrix only generates one, two mixing. And the, uh, the M up only generates the, the two, three mixing. And it can be shown that you can have this structure as a result of a Z4 symmetry. I will not give you the details. It's not particularly illuminating, you know. But it, it is technically, it is nice to see that this can be obtained in a natural way as a result of a symmetry, okay? So, so one can say that without having new physics, what you have is this matrix with zero here and this relationship. What is the amazing thing is that this relationship of V31 equal to V12, V23 is already satisfied almost by, by experiment. So if, if you just, V13 is small. You know, so our conjecture of, offers an explanation why, in the standard, why we, uh, we are seeing V31 much, it's a factor of three, larger than V13, because they have different origins. V V31 originates in the standard model. V13, not. It's beyond the standard model. So that's one thing that, uh, that we achieve. Uh, so now the, the real construction of a realistic model uh, is you introduce an up type vector like quark, assume uh, that the four by four matrix of this type, you know, put symmetry in such a way that the, the, the up uh, mixes the two and three, and then, uh, I'm sorry, I have to put them down. I, I'm down will be just the one and two, okay? I, I, I didn't put explicit them down, but them down just mixes the one, the first and second generations, okay? So then I have to, to be able to, with the vector like work, which appears in this, this, this is the type vector like work, to generate a realistic full VCKM matrix. That is done, so M down, yes, I have written here, M down is this matrix, you know, it just generates one and two. And M up, in the, in the standard model of type quarks, only generates this, you know, two, three. But when you introduce vector like quarks, in this particular example, is about uh, 1,250. I mean, the, the size of, of, uh, of the mass of a vector like quark, then you can generate uh, the right quark masses in the top sector and also in the down sector. Okay, so the full the full matrix will be a four times three uh, matrix. This is standard model, but but you will have also mixing with the, the top work, you know. This is a mistake, it should be capital T. So the, the VCKM no matrix will be, uh, uh, this is three by three sector, then but there will be mixings between, the physical one is, is, is these four, uh, the first three lines of a four by four matrix, okay? These things here, you may ask, why is this so small? And this is relatively large. This is relatively large to explain the, uh, the VCKM uh, lack of unitarity, okay? 
So this term here is relatively large. So that's why it solves the problem. This one we may ask, why is it so small, this one? Is to be in agreement, of course, we fine-tune that, but that is to be in agreement with the zero to zero by mixing. Okay? It's nothing wrong, but we don't know how, how to explain it. We adapt ourselves to the, to the smallness of, of uh, because this, uh, the physical part is this. This uh, uh, signifies uh, uh, violations of unitarity that lead to flavor change in neutral currents. This times this should not be large, it should be very small because of the zero, the zero bar mixing. Okay? So we have to do that. And with these things, you can, you, you can reproduce the correct value for gamma, sun, beta, and so on. That's not a big achievement because we have quite a few parameters. Okay? But it's interesting to see that you, you may have the origin of VCKM may be different from what people have been thinking. You know, they've been thinking that VCKM is originated from up quark diagonalization, down to quark diagonalization, nothing else. No, that is part of the story. The full story includes also new physics. Okay? <coughs> and the conclusions is that vector I quarks are one of the simplest extensions of the of the standard model with a large number of phonologic implications. Now VLQs, this is to emphasize, they are cousins of new R. What I mean by that is other particles like V what is special about new R is that its mass is not protected by gauge symmetry. It you know it does not violate uh, gauge symmetry and therefore can be arbitrary large. There are other objects, quarks, that have the same characteristics that the mass can be large. <coughs> So, and that, it, but can be cor corrected by chirosymmetry. You know, chirosymmetry always protects the mass of fermions. So, uh, they are, in that sense, they are new cardinal, which provide, uh, through seesaw, the most, well, well we know that the new art provides the most plausible explanation of smallness of the material mass. So, I'm just giving a special status to vector like work because they are cousins of new art, and we believe that new art is already appearing, uh, justifying the smallness of the of material mass, okay? The effects of, of vector class uh, uh, may have already been seen in the, the deviations of unitarity. That's wishful thinking, of course, but it's nice that at least one <laughs> uh, potential evidence for vector like works. Now, uh, weak points. So I've been making so uh, propaganda for vector like works. What is the weaker point? But it is a weak point, but it's a universal weak point of all proposed new physics. Okay? There is no, that, as far as I know, any proposal of new physics that we don't, that predicts the scale. In that respect, the standard model is absolutely unique. It's a, a, a model that predicts a scale. Okay? You cannot have, if, if the W and Z Maybe it could have been discovered if it's mass, but if they are not discovered, say, until LAC, uh, you know, uh, then uh, it will be impossible to, to have the standard model, okay? Predict the mass. But that's, the, the standard model is unique. You know, take the example of supersymmetry, which is a very respectful symbol. It does not predict the scale, you know? You don't discover it at 100 jab, well, let's increase the energy, one tap. You don't discover it one tap, you, it may be higher. How high? We don't know. It does not predict the scale. You just put the bounds. So, uh, to our young people, we should, <laughs> you should give advice. Predict, uh, make, make a new physics that predicts a scale, okay? That, that, that can be eliminated. That doesn't, uh, uh, that doesn't exist, you know? So, the SM was a not notable exception. I just remind you, those who are uh, too young to remember, that Right after the discovery of weak interactions, people like Fermi already thought of intermediate vector boson, and people like Marshak, many other people, thought of intermediate vector boson. You know what is the mass that they thought about that? The old book of 1967 of uh, Marshak, he puts already IVB, and the, the suggestion was about uh, 2 GB, you know, intermediate boson. You may find that that's very strange. You know, at that time, even the thought of elementary particle of an order of 100 JF, it was not in the heads of all the greatest people around, you know, at the time. It was only gauge theories that introduced this possibility. So, I'm sorry, what is that? Yeah, that is, uh, yes, I think that that's all, yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it looks like we're having 
you have posh family, uh, and you have a cow, but no. Oh no, I'm only. Uh, oh yes, yes, I'm only talking introducing vector-like words. We could also introduce uh, vector-like letters. That that I have not done. Okay, but but in a way, if you believe in old time. Uh, Latin folk symmetry, you should do that. It is perfectly possible, they lead to very interesting phenomena. Yes. Yes. You gave an example of uh, introducing a vector like quark. Yes. Do I understand correctly? All you introduced was an, an SU2 singlet up quark vector like? Y yes, yes, yes. The SU2 singlet, yes. Yes. And but we, one could do. Interesting things also with the uh, with the uh, uh, other representations. One thing that has been done, probably you, you know, is that quite a few people have suggested the unification of couplings with the uh, not with singlet vector-like quarks, but with the, the different Full families. Yes. 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 That, that type of thing. Yes. And 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 that is an interesting thing because you in that framework you don't need supersymmetry to unify the couplings, as you know. They are not exactly. Yes, sir. Uh, might, uh, in the Europe, uh, get unified theory, would you also use? Yes. Uh, do you make sense of the uh, get unified theory, like... Uh, E6, as you know, has vector-like quarks. E6. Uh, Gino has a question, yes. Yeah, first, uh, thanks a lot for this very, very nice... Uh, uh, construction, which I, I completely agree with you, vector like quarks are, are very general. I mean, now there, there are a lot of. T tomorrow, I will show you an example where I mean, we have vector like, and indeed, CKM is generated by the exchange with, with, a, with a vector like. But for instance, in, uh, you, you only want to put um, VUB from vector like. Uh, you could also, why not put also VCB? Because that is uh, also yes, small. Quite small, yes, 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 you are right, you are right. Of course, it's, it's a required a bit more assumption about a, a more extended model, but I think that yes. is also interesting, yes. right? That, I fully agree. I fully agree. And of course, it's a little bit arbitrary, you know, yeah. but uh, yeah. in the sense of choosing the smallest one. Yeah. But I agree with you that really, you did, I mean, this construction, it's it fit very well with, with a lot of models. So I think it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. it's very interesting. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, 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 yes. I, you know, I, I, I believe that there is one thing that we have learned from nature is that nature, for some reason, I don't know, likes simplicity. So that that is nice. But I mean, we should try the simplest thing. Look at, you know, the number. Of, you remember, you are old, uh, young enough to to remember right? that there are many models, right? Right after reversibility was proved by Etoft and, and Veltman, many models of, of case were suggested. You know, which one nature chose? The simplest one. And actually, if you don't want to introduce any new, it's the unique module, um, uh, uh, model, you know. If you don't want to introduce new uh, fermions, nothing, you know. Glashow had the one model where even the, the Z would not exist with, with the with the Glashow and Georgi model, you know, SO3. But, but there you have to introduce a new, a new heavy lepton, you know. <laughs> that, uh, with the, if you don't introduce a new fermions, then SU2 cross U1 is the simplest and the smallest. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. Uh, oh, so starting from today, you may pre-order a lunch basket which uh, contains a salad and a main dish for the following day. So, but you have to sign up 